Okay, so let's move to the third talk uh, in this session, which is coming from Professor Martin Blazer from Rutgers University in USA. And the talk is Microbiome and Health. So thank uh, you very much, uh, Martin, for again accepting this uh, invitation. And uh, as I say before to the rest of the speakers, the virtual stage is now yours. Thanks a lot. You are muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Now we don't see the slides. You will. Okay. Thank okay. you. How about now? Yes. You can hear me and see it. Okay, we're all set. Yes. So I, it's my pleasure to be here to follow the elegant work of Phil and, and Thomas. I'm going to talk about a very big picture story in humans called the unintended consequences of the use of antibiotics in childhood. This is a problem that concerns everyone, our children and our grandchildren. So we know that many diseases have increased in recent years. And I, I show three here, diseases of the esophagus, juvenile diabetes, and asthma all going up. And in fact, there are many other diseases that have been going up. And so the question is, uh, why, why is this happening? Let's see, I'm trying to forward. Uh, furthermore, it's not just in developed countries. Uh, diseases like obesity are increasing all over the world. Most of the overweight children in the world are in developing countries. Now we have more than 50 million. In a few years, there'll be 100 million children over the under the age of five who are overweight or obese. So let's bring it back to the microbiome. Uh, for this early talk, let me remind you that microbial cells outnumber human cells. They are highly diverse. They live in specific niches. Everyone uh, uh, has certain similarities, but everyone is unique. Long-term persistence is common of the human microbiome, and human biology is based on this partnership. So I pose the question, could changes in the human microbiome be underlying these plagues that I have just mentioned? So over the last 20 years, I've been developing an idea called the theory of the disappearing microbiota. It's based on the fact that there's essentially vertical transmission of the microbes from moms to babies. <clears throat> and this hypothesis has two major tenets, that changed human ecology has altered the transmission and maintenance of ancestral microbes, which affects the composition of the microbiota. And microbes, both good and bad, usually acquired early in life are especially important since they do affect a developmentally critical stage. About 15 years ago, Stan Falco and I enlarged this hypothesis, which is shown here, the step down of, of the microbiota. Our view was that ancient moms transferred an ancient microbiota to their offspring. If they lost microbes, then the next generation would be born at a deficit unless they got them back horizontally, and so on and so forth. And this is our view for what has been happening over the uh, 20th and now into the 21st century. Unfortunately, there's more and more evidence that this is correct, that the changes in the microbiota are cumulative. So what is driving this? I want to just focus on one element, which is antibiotics. Currently, there are more than 73 billion antibiotic doses used worldwide every year. That's 10 antibiotic pills for every man, woman, and child on earth. In the U.S., uh, it's about five courses for every six people every year. Children, by the time they're two, have gotten three courses of antibiotics, 10 courses by the time they're 10. And pregnant women, just before they uh, transfer the microbiota, uh, they are, more than 50% are receiving antibiotics. And there's exposures from antibiotic use on the farm. We don't even know the scale of this. Now, in developing countries, uh, antibiotic use may be even greater. Here's data from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation of eight cohorts of kids in developing countries looking at antibiotic use in the first two years of life. Um, I've drawn in a, this blue line, which is the USA. That's the level in the US. And what you can see is that six out of the eight 
places, the kids are receiving more antibiotics than in the U.S., including in Bangladesh and in Pakistan, where the average child is getting 10 courses of antibiotics in the first year of life. How is that possible? That children develop a fever or a cough, their parents love them, they go to a pharmacist or a street vendor who's happy to sell them an antibiotic. So we're concerned about the ecological effects of antibiotic exposures. I draw it like the proverbial iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is antibiotic resistance. We've been aware of this for 80 years. It's very visible. But the body of the iceberg, I believe, is microbe, microbiome disruption, which leads to clinical consequences. The disruptions could be transient or long-term. The consequences could be developmental, situational, senescent, or generational. And these can have immunologic, metabolic, neoplastic, or maternal manifestations. I'll show you a couple of examples of this. Now, the question is, are antibiotics related to these diseases or not? So I'd like to show you one study that we did with colleagues at the Mayo Clinic where we looked at all the children born in Olmsted County, Minnesota, where the Mayo Clinic is located. Uh, we, in total, we looked at about 14,000 children. Uh, we had two periods, a period of antibiotic exposure up to the age of two, and then a period of health outcomes up to the age of 14. And we asked, is antibiotic exposure in the early period related to the health outcomes in later period? In total, we looked at 10 common health conditions, allergic, and uh, inflammatory conditions, metabolic conditions, and neurodevelopmental conditions as shown here. Here's the adjusted hazard ratio. A hazard ratio of one is neutral. All ten, for all 10 conditions, the association with antibiotics was greater than one, and for eight of the 10, it was statistically significant. We also showed specific associations with number of antibiotic courses, timing of exposure, and antibiotic class. Um, and this, this is a study where we've looked at 10 things together. There have been many studies that have looked at individual illnesses showing the same effects. Now, recently, a really terrific paper was published uh, in Science Advances uh, by Elaine Shao's group, looking at the effect of the maternal microbiome on placental development in mice. And it's all encapsulated in this figure. Here we're looking at placental vascular development. This is a normal mouse. This is the placental vasculature. Here's a germ-free mouse. You see this enormous difference. Here's an antibiotic-treated mouse. It's, it's very similar to the germ-free. We're not seeing the tremendous normal ramification, uh, recolonizing the mice uh, with, uh, with microbes restores this. So this is a microbial phenomenon. Microbes are involved in this important developmental stage in mammals. So what about uh, antibiotics? Uh, is there a causal relationship or not? So we began to do studies in mice. And this is, I'm gonna show you one study by Lori Cox that was done about a decade ago. Uh, Lori gave uh, mice uh, lifetime antibiotics or no antibiotics or only eight weeks of antibiotics or four weeks of antibiotics. And following up on other studies, she looked at the total mass, lean mass, and fat mass of the mice. The black line is the control group. What she found is that all three antibiotic groups had increased total lean and fat mass, so four weeks was sufficient for the full effect. Then we looked at the microbiome, and first we looked at three weeks. At three weeks, there were only two groups of mice. Control mice, no antibiotics, and all three antibiotic groups were receiving the antibiotics. Here's a principal coordinate analysis. Control in black, antibiotic in orange, a lot of diversity in their microbiome, some overlap between the two. It's a little different, not surprising, because one group is receiving antibiotics, the other isn't. Now we go to eight weeks, and at eight weeks, there are three groups of mice. Controls, no antibiotics, continued antibiotics, or antibiotics, and then stop. And so here's the control in black. Here's antibiotics in orange. It's more different than before. But the antibiotics in stop group, they've norm their microbiota has normalized. So the effect of the antibiotic was transient but the effect on the phenotype was permanent. This was our first evidence that altering the microbiota at a critical early stage in development could have long-term consequences. We've continued these studies in other models. Here's a model of type one diabetes done by Shusong Zhang, uh, in which we gave uh, mice 
the NOD mice that get type 1 diabetes, either three antibiotic courses or none, or one course or none, and then we track diabetes. Here's the Kaplan-Meier analysis. The control mice are developing diabetes as we expect, but the mice that get antibiotics are developing diabetes sooner and more of it. So this is driving this inflammatory condition as well. Now, I'll show you a more recent study where we've been looking at allergy. This is work that Tim Bourbet uh, has done in which he gave mice uh, the two most common antibiotics used in the United States, azithromycin or amoxicillin or not. And then he challenged them with an antigen, house dust mite antigen, a, a classical allergen, and sensitizing them and then challenging them. And we looked at the microbiome uh, and we looked at phenotypes. So here's the effect of early life antibiotic exposure on pulmonary markers of allergy. To make a long story short, the group that got antibiotics in the early life had increased levels of uh, total in cells in the lung, eosinophils, neutrophils, IgE in the serum and in the lung. So we wanted to see, is that uh, a, a microbiome effect? So we transferred after the antibiotics, we saved fecal samples, we transferred them to adult mice, and then uh, we studied the mice to see if they would develop the phenotype. And, and the answer is they did not develop the phenotype. So now we did a second experiment where we looked at these uh, adult mice that were transferred, and now we studied their offspring. And in their offspring, uh, we asked the question, was there a phenotype? And now we have it. And when we put those two experiments together, it suggests that in the first case, when we looked at the adult mice, we missed the window of vulnerability. But starting from birth, we caught the window of vulnerability and we could recapitulate changes. And in fact, we further put them into an, uh, uh, an asthma model using methicoline challenge. And we showed that the, the mice that had received the antibiotics in early life had these markers of asthma. And you can see that in the paper. So how are we gonna solve this problem, this universal problem? One is to control antibiotic use, but very important is restoration. And of course, that's what the microbiota vault will be leading to. So in Shusong's experiment, in a new experiment, he, instead of two groups of uh, control and antibiotics, in, the, in a subgroup of antibiotic treated mice, he gave them fecal microbiota transfer, fecal transfer from healthy moms. Here's the Kaplan-Meier control in blue, antibiotics in red, we have the expected difference. With the sequel transfer, we've restored them almost to baseline. So rest, this is a proof of principle. Restoration is possible in this kind of model. Interestingly, the group that looked at placental vascularity, they tried another kind of restoration. They gave short chain fatty acids uh, to antibiotic treated mice, and they could restore the kind of uh, uh, ramification. So in summary, Diversity loss is occurring around the world in the microbiota. Here we show an industrialized country, a country with late modernization. That could be India or China or, or perhaps in Latin America. Here's a more developing place, let's say in Africa. We're all, it's all going down. It's going downhill. This was the view in 2016. The question is, what's the future going to bring? Is it going to decline further? Are we going to be able to arrest the decline? Or are we going to be able to reverse it? through restorative steps. And that's up to this next generation. So there are future uh, potential microbiota-based therapeutics that uh, are being uh, uh, developed. Uh, these include specific kinds of fecal microbiota transfer, pre, pro, and postbiotics, and also genetically engineered strains. The, the future is quite good in this field. I wrote about the general topic uh, about 10 years ago in Missing Microbes. It's in a number of different languages. And more recently, there's been a film about the extinctions called the Invisible Extinction. And you can see it on Amazon and Apple uh, in many countries of the world. And with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Blazer, for your amazing talk.